the last few weeks, I've been seeing a lot of hate directed towards the Civ series for a new end user license agreement. People on Steam are accusing the game of collecting a frankly worrisome amount of personal information and even calling the game spyware. The Civ games ran into the same problem about a year ago with an ad tracking software found in their game called Red Shell. Red Shell collected a bunch of data about the game's players for what they said was advertising purposes. Eventually, Civ caved and removed Red Shell from their game due to outcry from the community. But it looks like Civ is back to collecting data. And you know what? They're not the only ones. In fact, pretty much any game with an internet connection is collecting some kind of metrics about you. Data collection is now a massive industry. The big data market is projected to hit $203 billion by 2020. By comparison, the video game industry just barely hit $135 billion in 2018. So it's no surprise that video game developers are realizing it's their time to cash in on the big data market. Every time you install a game, or really any time you install any piece of software, you've probably run into this screen. This is an end user license agreement, or for shorthand, a EULA. More likely than not, you don't read all of it, or really any of it, and you just scroll to the bottom and hit accept. Honestly, vacuuming your ceiling is probably a better use of your time than reading every single EULA. If you tried to read every EULA the average consumer agrees to in one year, it would take you about 76 work days to read them all. That's eight hours a day for about 11 weeks straight. And that's just to read the words, not comprehend them. EULAs are so full of incomprehensible legal nonsense that even seasoned attorneys have a hard time figuring out what they mean sometimes. But once you understand what a EULA is and a few privacy law principles, it becomes much easier to understand how your personal data is collected and used in accordance with these end user license agreements. To simplify, a EULA is a kind of contract. And when you're looking specifically at video games, it's more like a licensing contract. It's a lot different than something like buying a car. When you buy a car, it's yours. If you want to change out the engine, that's fine. You want to cover it in anime waifus, whatever, congrats, you can. Shoot into space for all I care. But that's different than leasing a car. If you're leasing a car, you're expected to give it back eventually. And the dealership is not going to be happy if you bring the car back covered in Asuka stickers. You're given a license to use the car so long as you keep paying the lease but you can't just do anything you want with it. Buying a game is a lot like leasing a car. You don't get the rights to do whatever you want with the game. You get a license to play the game based on the terms dictated in the EULA. When you click agree, you're agreeing to all the terms outlined in that EULA. If the EULA says that you only get to play on every other Tuesday and you agree, that's that. You only get to play every other Tuesday. You agreed to pay for the game and use it according to the terms they outlined. Of course, that's assuming that the terms they outlined in the EULA are actually legal and enforceable. Many EULAs have unenforceable clauses in them put in essentially as scare tactics against an uninformed consumer. One example of that is a clause preventing the user from criticizing the product publicly. Obviously, this raises huge free speech issues and likely wouldn't be found enforceable in a court of law. But sometimes it's enough for big corporate attorneys to threaten litigation under these EULA terms to get small or independent consumers to not criticize the product. I'm not going to go through all of the predatory type of EULA terms, so if you want a more detailed list, check out this link to a guide written by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They're great. One of the most common sections found in a EULA is the company's privacy policy. 
If a company is going to collect data on individuals, they're required to have a privacy policy outlining the types of data collected, why that data is being collected, how the data is being collected, and how the data is shared with third parties. All this information is usually stated in the EULA or in a privacy policy on an attached website. But before we dive in and take a look specifically at Take Two's privacy policy, it's important to understand some basics about privacy law. Privacy law differs drastically based on where you live. If you live in Europe, Congrats, you're covered by the GDPR, which has drastically superior privacy protections than US laws. The GDPR regulates data collection by requiring that consent should be given by a clear affirmative act establishing a freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous indication of the data subject's agreement to the processing of personal data relating to him or her. Now, that's a mouthful, but it's basically just a pretty long-winded way of saying that you have to agree to let them collect data about you. The GDPR places three requirements on companies collecting data. First, the data subject, you, must be informed about his or her right to withdraw consent at any time. That means you can withdraw from data collection at any time, and they need to let you know that up front. Second, withdrawal must be as easy as giving consent, which means no digging through pages and pages of a poorly optimized website looking for that unsubscribe button. And finally, consent has to be unambiguous, meaning it was either through a statement or a clear affirmative act. Essentially, under the GDPR, a company can't infer or imply consent through other actions. For example, in the US, consent to a privacy policy can be inferred through something as simple as actually using the software, or something like breaking the seal on the box containing the CDs with the software on it. The other major requirement under the GDPR is renewed consent is needed for every new usage of data that wasn't covered in the first consent agreement. For example, let's say the first time you gave consent, there was nothing about the company keeping track of how many controllers you destroyed out of frustration fighting Smo and Ornstein. Why is this goddamn boss fight? Ready with the BS. Okay. This guy, what the f No, you're behind the pillar. you, no. God. I wish that God damn it. If they wanted to start collecting that statistic, they would need to get your consent again before they started collecting the data. When it comes to privacy law, the US is like Shaq. He's ever in the 90s and has no idea what he wants to be. I mean, is he an actor? Is he a tennis player? A karate? A policeman? Is is Shaq in esports now? Wait, he owns NRG? Shaq is in Counter-Strike? It's like I always said, guys, Shaq is the future of video games. The US doesn't have any overarching data privacy law. Instead, it's regulated by a bunch of different statutes and state law. State law varies depending on which state you're in, so it makes it pretty difficult to identify any one specific set of rules that developers would need to follow. So instead of looking at each state and the differences between laws there, I'm just going to focus on the basic principles of privacy law in the US. Most states' data privacy rules work off the idea of personally identifiable information, or P. P originally comes from the 1984 Cable Communications Policy Act, or the Cable Act. It prevented cable operators from collecting any P from a subscriber without their consent and informing subscribers with what they would do with their P. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, the Cable Act forgot to define what P actually is, a trend which has continued on to this day. So now, there are three common approaches to identifying what exactly P stands for. First, there's the tautological approach, then there's the non-public approach, and finally, the specific types approach. 
So let's go through each one individually. Something is tautological, essentially, if it's a needless repetition of an idea. For example, the game Super Army War is a pretty tautological title. There's an army, there's war. When there's war, there's an army. If there's an army, there is war. It's all essentially the same idea. It's a vicious circle. So the tautological approach to personally identifiable information is just any information that identifies a person. The advantage of this approach is that it's left pretty broad for the courts to determine what kind of information is PII, but it has the exact same weakness. It really doesn't do anything to help us understand what PII is. So at the end of the day, it's not really that useful. Then there's the non-public approach. The non-public approach defines PII by focusing on what kind of information is not PII. So if something is not public information, if it's something that can't be found in the public domain, then that would make it PII. Now, it's pretty obvious that this approach was thought of before the internet, because now basically everything about you is somewhere on the internet. In fact, a lot of people have voluntarily posted it on the internet in Twitter or Facebook or other social media. So the non-public approach leaves a question of what exactly qualifies as information in the public domain. If everything found online is in the public domain, then there isn't a whole lot of information left to be protected. Finally, there's the specific types approach. This approach comes from a Massachusetts statute which defines PII as a person's first name and last name, or first initial and last name, in combination with either a social security number, driver's license number, financial account number, or credit card or debit card number. The problem here is exactly the opposite of the tautological approach. This approach is far too restrictive in its definition of PII and doesn't really allow for any interpretation. It, instead, there's only specific types of information that qualify as PII. Keep in mind though, just because something qualifies as PII doesn't necessarily mean that a company can't collect that information. It just limits how they can use it after they've collected it. So with PII in mind, let's take a look at Take-Two's privacy policy. Take-Two's privacy policy applies to all online service users. That means if you're playing a game with any online function, then this privacy policy applies. Due to how games work these days and the rise of always online games, this pretty much means if you're playing the game, then the privacy policy applies. Now, I wanted to tackle this portion of the privacy policy first. I've seen some Reddit posts addressing this section saying, you know, look, the privacy policy only collects data on you through one of these methods that it lists, like when you're applying for jobs or if you request technical support. Thing is, that's just not true. If you look at this section, it says when they take personal information, it usually, takes the form of, and then it gives a list. Now, it's the use of usually there that gives me pause. Lawyers use something called statutory interpretation to deconstruct complicated clauses and laws to try and understand what they actually mean. Usually that's used for understanding statutes, but I think it works well here too. When there's a list given, if it starts off with something like includes, that means that the following list are non-exhaustive examples. It does not mean that the list contains every single part of the list. So when we look at Take-Two's privacy policy, their use of the word usually functions pretty much the same as using includes. Just because they list these different methods of collecting data doesn't mean that that's the only way they collect data. They're just a couple examples of how they do. Then in the next section, they list out the kinds of information that they collect. And it's a lot. Most of the things on this list seem like they could be PII. Notably, the policy says it can collect things like your photo, 
your geolocation, your IP address, your first name, last name. It's a lot of information that it's collecting. And that's just the information that Take Two collects. Their privacy policy also allows third party advertising agents to collect info, like your IP address or other device IDs. The advertisers can also track how long you play a game. That's included in a generalized term in the policy, saying they can collect information regarding your use of or activities in connection with a website or online service. Then they give an example as time spent using your purchase, i.e. the game that you're playing. But that's just one example. There are many other potential types of information that could fall under activities in connection with a website or online service. Not to mention, the privacy policy states that these third-party advertisers can collect information on the types of pages you visit. Think about your browser history and think about what that says about you. Finally, by agreeing to this privacy policy, you're in effect agreeing to these third parties' privacy policies too. Take-Two even acknowledges that they don't have access or control over these third party advertisers. So when you agree to Take-Two's policy, you're also agreeing to the third party advertisers' use of all your data as well. But PII should protect me, right? They can't share any information that would personally identify me. So even if they do sell off my data, it's not like that data could ever be linked back to me, right? Well, not exactly. Remember, just because something is PII doesn't mean a company can't collect that information. It just restricts what they can do with it or if they can sell it. So while they may not be able to directly distribute your information linked under your name or some other directly identifying information, they can still distribute it anonymously under some kind of ID number. Here's why collecting something like your user ID number is more nefarious than it initially sounds. Your user ID number is not PII. It is a number assigned to your information that isn't your name or anything else directly identifying you. It comes in a bunch of different forms. For Facebook, there's a user ID number. For your phone, there's an Android or Apple ID number. Essentially, it's any account you make that gets linked with some kind of identification number. And since it's just a number designating your account, it isn't as restricted in who that information can be shared with since it doesn't directly identify you. Here's one way that you specifically can be identified through using nothing more than some kind of ID number. Let's say you're playing your favorite game. Unbeknownst to you, the game's privacy policy allows them to collect info on how long you've played the game and what kind of decisions you've made. So now, they know exactly how long you've played Honey Pop. They package all that information into a bundle linked by your IP address and sell it to a third-party advertising agency. The advertising agency then takes that data and links it to other data they've gathered under the same IP address. Let's say information they got from an Amazon account with the same IP. Now, that Amazon account also has a linked Android ID. Now, that Android ID from the Amazon account is linked to the IP from the game data collection. This can keep happening over and over with different types of technically non-identifying information to create a vast web of data all linked to a single individual without ever specifically identifying them. Then, the advertising agency that has been collecting all of this non-personally identifying information about you sells off a ton of packages of data to an interested party. Let's say Google. Google can then compare that data package with data they've collected and discover that, hey, your Gmail account linked with your name, address, and a bunch of other PII is associated with the same IP address and Android ID as one of the data packages they purchased. So now, 
Google can associate all of that non-PII data that they purchased with you. Yes, you. I'm talking to you, Jeff. Google knows you went with the cat girl, Jeff. You need to run, Jeff. They're coming for you, Jeff. <sighs> Take-Two also lets you make a request to delete, correct, or get a copy of all the personal information they've collected on you. I actually put in a request for a copy of all the data that they have on me, but I've gotten nothing back yet. I'll give an update on that in the next video. Speaking of, this video is already about 10 minutes over the length that I was shooting for, so I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here. In the next video, I'm going to be covering how all of this data collected about you can actually affect you. Stay tuned.